Hey guys, it's Don from Soundsphere Magazine and Wobbling About Rocking Out. Just had a wonderful chat with the flamboyant Balan Vane, an old friend of mine who's doing amazing things for the fetish community with his KEN, uh, Kinky Erotic Nature Night, uh, and also about his where he found his voice. Again, such a, such a confident flamboyant figure, uh, his background in the creative arts and so much more. It was an absolute pleasure. I'm really, really proud of this one. I hope you enjoy it. We'll see you again soon. Thank you so much for watching. Hello, so I'm sat here today with Val and Vane. Uh, we go back quite a long way. It's an absolute we do. pleasure to, to sit with you in your incredibly colour coordinated uh, <laughs> home. Uh, you, yeah, I, lo I love the red, mate. You're, you're looking fantastic. Um, Thank you very much. So I know you. I know. I know what you do. You, you know, you've worked in arts and entertainment for many years. You obviously uh, worked in, in in different parts of the community. Uh, but for those that have never met you before and, and aren't subscribed to your channels and platforms, who are you? And what is your background? What do you do? How's it going? I'm Valen Vane. Vane by name. Vane by nature. Deep as a puddle in summer, and love myself just that little bit too much. Just that little bit to the point where. I, oh, am I allowed to swear? Can you I, are, can right, I you swear? are allowed, I'm allowed to, to swear. Yeah. Sweet. In which case, to the point where uh, if they brought around cloning, I'd go fuck myself. Literally. <laughs> you know, <laughs> it's it's uh, very much the brand. The brand is excessive vanity. And uh, I love it. I absolutely love it. I mean, as you can see, I bought a house because it was number 69 and decorated like Prince Fuck the Moulin Rouge. It's just, <laughs> it's just my thing. It's, you know? incre it's incredible, man. It's incredible. I, and we'll, we'll talk a little about your, your background in a second. Mm -hmm. uh, to, to what extent, you know, again, what I see out in the world isn't that different to the persona no. of Alan Vane. So is there a disconnect or is what, what um, you see, you know, what, tell me a little bit about that. Not really. It, it's a really interesting one because, like, I mean, geez, I've been Valen Vane for oh, long, long going time. on, yeah, going on 15 years now. Um, and, and it's weird because like, I don't know whether there was a disconnect originally, but over the years, like one has just blended into the other, the, the stage presence has blended into my actual life. And it's really cool because I don't like, the, there's always been that level of realism where I don't want to be this fake poser kind of creature. Do you know what I mean? But naturally I'm a very loud flamboyant individual who's just really confident, really self-confident. I'm like, I still have the same doubts that everybody else does, but I'm just like, ah, fuck it, was it matter? Do you know what I mean? What's the worst that can happen? Let's let's go for it, you know? Um, so it's, yeah, like, I, I can't say it's any different. What I would say is, like, like, if you see me on a stream, like, that's the way I am. But you want, there's always, like, a point where people can see where, like, I turn on the, the show bravado, almost. Like, when somebody raids in and I go into that, like the the spiel that I just went into is just like oh yes and here we are <laughs> and it's that like it's it's still a part of me it's still a massive part of me but it's not like a it's not like a, a fake part of me do you know yeah it's it's yeah. an interesting one for sure absolutely so did you discover because you went to university obviously we we grew up on the alternative scene in Yorkshire and then you left the city to go to university and you uh, in your in your your background your degree was 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 theater based did you discover the the persona and, and did you really discover yourself um, during that time so not really uh so I went away to university to do theater um and actually did like professed in the backstage side of things I did lighting and sound and and special effects before I did any kind of acting, which is fucking hilarious <laughs> because you see me on stage now doing all these hosting cabarets and stuff. And it's just like, there's no way you were ever behind the scenes, but that, that was where I, that was where I started. And then I remember my girlfriend at the time, um, got into modeling and asked me to come along to a shoot. And I was like, yeah, by all means. Then we had a shoot together and I was like, this is really cool. I really enjoy this. Um, and it was that kind of like, I, I'm guessing many people have, are the same. Like when you, when you leave university, because you've done the same thing for three years or five years or however long, you are sick to death of it. You're like, I don't want anything to do with this. So I was like, I did theater. I was like, I don't want anything to do with theater. And then I discovered cabaret and I was like, wait a minute. This is like five minute theater where I can just be ridiculously egotistical and have a laugh. And, and then I'm done. And that's, that's it. That's great. You know? Um, so that was kind of where, like, the birth between the modeling and the cabaret side of things, that was like the birth of what is now known as, like, me, the Val and Vane that everyone knows and loves, you know? 
Absolutely, man. Absolutely. And we'll talk a little about your sort of journey, you know, to streaming and stuff in a minute. But but I am fascinated because you've managed to move. You moved back to the area and you made a living uh, in in the creative arts. You were modeling. You were doing uh, presentation. Yeah. You were doing uh, stage pantomime touring. How how difficult was that being being based you know in East Yorkshire? Did you find that was a challenge? Because um, a lot of young people that I work with in the theatre and the arts, they sort of automatically assume they've got to leave Hull, they've got to live East Yorkshire. What was that experience like for you? Yeah, it's a it's a nightmare. It's a nightmare, and and it's especially being. I mean, I can only speak for the my own experience yeah. of of the creative industry. But um, being an actor, being a performer is one of the hardest jobs going because only 20% of it is, is performance and you are so easily replaceable. Like for every, for every one person that goes for a job, there are 10 re like replacements that, that can easily be picked up, you know? Mm. Um, so it's, it's a really hard one. I think the, the thing that I didn't appreciate when I was in university doing performance stuff was... Uh, the the most important thing to any creative person, especially in the acting industry and what have you, having a driver's license. It's having a driver's license. Forget all your qualifications. Get that <laughs> driver's license. Get yourself on some insurance documents. Um, because I found like I didn't know how to drive when I left university. It wasn't until I was in my mid twenties that I actually learned how to drive. And Jesus, like. Like it was very hindering having to take trains to places and having to rely on other people driving and bits and pieces. They, it, yeah, I, driver's license is definitely the most important thing. And I, as soon as I got it, I was like, how did I live without this? <laughs> this is mad. Opens up so many new worlds. I can travel anywhere and do anything. Um, yeah. But based in, based in like the Yorkshire area, not really. Um, it's... It's an interesting one. It's a proper roller coaster of a of an industry because there are times when you are pushing yourself and pushing yourself and pushing yourself, mm. and there's a lot of things that people don't teach you, like how to price yourself. You turn around and you're a freelance performer, like it's all very well joining equity and stuff and getting your your insurance and being backed by the union and stuff, and that's great, that's amazing, and and I I pay for it all the time because I think it's invaluable and and it's totally worth the money in my personal opinion. Mm. But like, not many people pay a equity rate. Not many people pay equity rates, and and a lot of them turn around and be like, "Cool, this is how much we're prepared to pay you." And you turn around and go, "Cool, well, I want the equity rates because I'm equity representing." They're like, "Fine, we'll find somebody else." And you go, "Shit, I've got a choice of going for the job mm. that I know I'm going to get some money for and paying my bills, or..." standing my ground and asking for equity rates and then not getting the job and therefore being out of pocket anyway. So it, it's, it's a constant battle. And because you never know how much you're worth, it's, it's a really bizarre one. I remember doing a lot of uh, freelance work for a few companies and one of them turned around to me and they were like, hey, look, your, your pricing is all over the place. Like, how much do you actually charge? And I was like, look, normally you just throw prices at me and I say yes or no. And they were like, cool, well, we need to work out your day rate and your half day rate. And I was like, fine. And I was like, oh, yeah, I'll be worth uh, 50 quid a day. Do you know what I mean? Thinking um, I'm relatively fresh out of university. I've not really thought about it. 50 quid a day sounds great. Sounds like a wonderful amount of that. And they're like, here, how about 200 pounds a day? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah, that sounds great. That sounds wonderful. Um, and then obviously, like, it's it's the more the experience in the thing that you start to learn how much you're worth. And because nobody talks about money, nobody talks about mm. how much things should be worth, you have no idea how, whether, whether you're pricing yourself well or pricing yourself, like, well against other people and what have you. And now I've got, like, all kinds of pricing formula, like, documents that I'm, like, I've run by other people in the industry. And I'm like, does this sound about right? And they're like, yes or no. Um, but... Initially, it's it's a it's an absolute nightmare because mm. because all you want to do is pay your bills and yeah. and do what what is what is your passion. But that in effect in effect is like twenty percent of the job. The rest of it's paperwork and math. Yeah. <laughs> you know? yeah. Absolutely. Do you feel like you've got it right yet? Uh, more or less, more or less. Or I did until I started streaming. Um, and then the live the live stream world is another brand new area of entertainment, and it's like cool. So where do I stand now? <laughs> like I, I know where I stand in a performance thing, like 
element, uh, but I am very aware that if I start throwing that, those prices at certain companies being like, cool, yeah, that's fine. You can get me to do a two hour, three hour stream on this thing. And this is my, but this is how much I cost. Mm -hmm. Um, like they, some people are just like, yeah, cool. Sounds great. And then other people are like, not a chance. You are worth that. And I'm like, you, you people don't know the industry better than I do. Like what is going on? <laughs> Am I worth this? Am I not worth this? Talk to me here. Like, you know, it'd be really yeah. nice if there was like a, like a, 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 a consultant fee of somebody you could like somebody who was like an agent that you could just be like, Hey, I know that I can't join up to your agency or I know that your books are closed or whatever, but Hey, how about I pay you 200 quid to go through my social media presence or my, my um, portfolio or what have you. And you tell me how much I'm worth. Mm. That would be really cool. Uh, yeah. like, and if, if you, uh, if uh, to all of our listeners and all readers, uh, if you know of anybody, please comment, <laughs> do do the thing. Let Soundsphere know so they can let me know. <laughs> absolutely. Uh, absolutely, man. I mean, that that's, moves on nicely to my next question because what you're talking about is, is the stuff people don't talk about, you know, the money and, and the finances. If somebody's inspired by your work and somebody has seen your streams and wants to, you know, wants to emulate you, what kind of things do you want to see from somebody in order to make a success of themselves? And also, what do you not want to see? What kind of things do you see people slip up on uh, when they're trying to get into that world of arts, entertainment, and making a living as a creative? That is a very, very good question. That is a very, very good question. I think my first bit of advice is never try and be anybody but yourself. Um, because you can, like, people can try and be me, for example, but they're only ever going to be a second best me because I am naturally the best me because it's me. You know what I mean? Whereas nobody ever can be as good as of, of being you as you are. So don't try and be somebody else. Be the best you you can be. And you can be the best you you can be. All you got to do is, is work on yourself and work towards your self-confidence and realize the, that you're not the, the worst thing in the world like many of our brains tell us we are. Um, and as a result of that, like, like following on from that, if there's ever like a job interview you're going for, an audition you're going for, like... Don't go to an audition. This is the thing that really got through my head when I first like left university and was going out into the world and what have you. Don't go to an audition to get the job. Mm. Go to an audition to show them how good you are at performing. Okay. And that, that little change in the mindset does two things. One, it means that in your brain, you're not, like you don't see it as a pass or a failure. You see it as a showcase of your work, which means that mentally like mental health wise mm. you're not constantly beating yourself up um mm. but two it also means that you might not be right for the role or the job that they are looking for that moment in time but mm. then you are in their mind for something else that might pop up the amount of jobs that i've gone for an audition for and they're like hey you're not what we're after but we're doing this show in about six months and we'd love you to come down and audition for that as well you know and it's like that's the thing. It's it's not an audition. Isn't a oh in my mind anyway. An audition isn't a job application. An audition is a is my portfolio of all the shit that I can do. Yeah, yeah. You know. Yeah, yeah. So it's about it's about going there. You know, not not necessarily saying I need to get this job, but it's about using it as an experience. Yes, perspective yeah. is is everything. This is what I've learned over my very colorful life. <laughs> that. The perspective and the way that you view things can change everything from being a mortifying like situation, like a mortifying rejection or whatever, to being, all right, cool, like that didn't happen, but now they know what I can do. See what happens next time, you know? Yeah, absolutely. And that is, that is very hard for a lot of people to, yeah. to get their heads around because the fear of rejection is, is prevalent in our society, hugely yeah. prevalent in our society. People are, people are afraid to ask questions for fear of getting the answer no. And... No is a very, like, I, I don't fully understand it. It's like going out on, uh, a, like going out to a bar and being like, hey, I like that person. That person's very attractive. Excuse me. Could I buy you a drink? And they turn around and say no. And you go, cool, no worries. Yeah. And get on with your life. It doesn't matter. It doesn't need to be the be all and end all. Just be like, cool, that's all right. Or you've got a friend and you're just like, hey, how's it going? I'd love to take you, uh, uh, I'd love to date you or whatever. And they go, no. It's like, cool, no worries. That's fine. We can still be friends. It's all good, you know? Yeah, absolutely, man. Absolutely. And and we'll talk a little bit about um, some more around confidence now because it was, you definitely are, you know, 
I, I've met a lot of people in my life. I've had the fortune of, 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 of knowing a lot of people traveling around, but you are without question one of the more confident people I've ever met in my life. And that has been the case. I think we met around 16, maybe a little older. Have you, this is before I knew you. So if you could take me back to where you found your voice. And so this oh. is a question. So, so where did it happen? Was there a moment or a series of moments where you found your voice, you found your confidence, or was it again something that happened for you much later? Oh, on? it was it was a, a single moment. And okay. and this is when people turn around and say that you can't change your life in one decision. I disagree. As mm -hmm. I did. As I did. Um, I remember very clearly. Here we go. Story time with Val and Vane. Yeah. Um, I remember very clearly I was stood in my teenage years. I was maybe 13. Okay. Yeah, about 13. Um, and I was stood in my in my parents' bathroom, staring into the mirror, staring into like the black of my eye, being like, Valen, you're so hollow. There's no, you know, like that teenage angst you feel where you're angry and you're not entirely sure why. Um, and that just all those emotions of running around and rampant, and you're, you're not sure what's going on because you don't know who you are and you're trying to discover yourself and all that stuff is going on. Um, and I remember like looking in the bathroom, looking in the, the black of my eye and being like, you're hollow. There's nothing to you. There's no, there's no value in you. There's nothing. Mm. Um, and I, so I stood there and I looked at myself and I picked myself apart and I was like, these things are not cool. These things are disgusting. This is why people don't like you. All of the usual stuff that, the, that I would say pretty much all teenagers go through. Um, and then I took a step back and I closed my eyes. And I opened my eyes and I looked at myself as a whole picture. And this is something that a lot of people really struggle with is when they look at themselves in the mirror, they look at the details. They look at here is like my nose is slightly crooked. My ears are slightly misaligned. My, one of my eyes is higher than the other. My chin's off to one side, my teeth are whatever, whatever the scenario may be, mm. they look at the details and they look at the details they don't like because they're so used to them. And that's where their eye is naturally drawn. But when you look at somebody else, you look at them as a full picture. Mm. You look at them as one whole painting. You're like, that person looks absolutely amazing because you're seeing everything about their face and their body and their outfit and their presence and the way they hold each to themselves and everything. You know, when you look at yourself, you see details. And this is what I did. I took a step back and I closed my eyes and I opened my eyes and I looked at myself as a full picture for the first time in my life. And I was like, do you know what? You're not the most beautiful person in the world, but you're not that bad. <laughs> And that, that was a moment that was like a real changing moment in my mind was just like, you're not that bad. And then I thought about two of the coolest people I knew. I was like this one guy who's like super laid back all the time, takes everything in his stride. He's just really fucking cool. And, and everyone loves him because of the fact that he's so laid back. And then this other guy who's like really energetic and like going around and being really sociable with everybody, really good at sports and doing bits and pieces and what have you. And I was like, the perfect person in the world would be a mesh of these two people. And I went, cool. I'm going to be that person. Okay. And that was it. That was, that was the birth of Val and Vane. That's where it all started. That's at that moment, the following day I was bullied and people were just like, Oh, Valen's gay. And I was like, yes. And what's your point? Mm, God damn. Calm yourself. You know? Yeah. And as the gay, gay was the nineties, uh, yes. the slur. And nowadays everyone's like, it's a sexuality. What's your point? Like, <laughs> come on now, <laughs> deal with this. But yeah. you know, yeah, um, person of extremes is the best, way, the best way to be. Absolutely, and it's interesting. I mean, a lot of people would look at that and be like, well, "What's his secret? How do you do that?" Was it a was you mentioned closing your eyes? You know, was it a deep breath? Like, is it something you can? <laughs> is it something you can teach? Something you can bottle up? Being able to see um, yourself in that way? Have you been able to help other people through your work do that? No, and 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 I mean, I've I've seemed to have helped other people. People have yeah. told me that I've helped them. Um, I've got like a mantra on my live stream, which is, um, God, do I look rough, but God damn, do I make rough look good? Mm -hmm. And, and people in the community have like taken a Sharpie marker and written that on their mirror. So when they wake up, they see themselves in the mirror and then they see that slogan and no matter what they're thinking about themselves, they think about me, they think about the confidence, they think about our community that's really supportive mm -hmm. and, and helps each other out. And we come from all kinds of different walks, like of life, different sexualities, different genders, different, um, ethnicities and religions and ages and they're just like Do you know what that's all right and if it can put a smile on their face for that split second then the day set, starts off on a slightly better foot and yeah. that's that's all that matters to me i started it started as a gimmick and people were like yeah i write this on my mirror i was like fucking hell if it helps you out be a more positive person go for it go for it run with it love this 
And amazing, I'm, amazing, man. You know, I'm really, really, you know, proud to see what you've been able to accomplish uh, with your brand. And, 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 you know, since, you know, we, we've kind of grown up together and I, I, I think it's, uh, I think it's fantastic, mate. I really do. I think obviously I can see evidence as well. I think that's the coolest thing. You can see evidence in the comments and the way people reflect on your streams. People do love it. People do really yeah. value your work. That's and it, it blows my mind because yeah. uh, this this was not how it started. It started like the way I viewed streaming was the way I view uh, cabaret. Mm. So I do I do a lot of hosting and like yeah. yes I do the Alaskan bits and pieces, but most of it's all hosting and and being the host with the most the uh, the person that's just in your face and and the person that fills the time between the the acts that people are actually here to see. And I love that shit. But that's all like a lot of it thinking on your feet and and interacting, but. Yeah, I, that's how I viewed streaming. I was like, cool, I'm going to go into this situation and I'm going to perform. I'm going to sit in front of the camera and entertain people and do some gimmicky jokes and all fun and games and tell some anecdotes and, and people will giggle, which is really weird when you first start streaming and you're like, and pause for laughter. There is no <laughs> laughter. Shit. Um, yeah. And that's that was originally how I started. That's originally how I started off streaming. And then yeah. as people came by, the more I relaxed, and the more I was like, you know what, this is cool. This is all right. Like, I'm just chatting to mates. I'm just chatting to friends. And the community grew and more people came down and we'd have more serious conversations about mental health, about uh, sexuality and gender. And I would be proved wrong on so many things. Like, I would have perceptions of, mm -hmm. of life and what have you. And people would be like, actually, that's wrong. Can we, can we talk about that? And I'm like, yeah, let's talk about it. I'm, prove me wrong. If I'm wrong, tell me I'm wrong. Mm -hmm. Like, Never be afraid of being wrong, people, because it makes you a better person for when you learn what is correct, you know? Yeah, absolutely. It was an interesting lesson in that. And and before we do talk about some of those conversations that you had, which is one of the things that has, has drawn me to you over the years, is, is, again, these honest conversations that you're having. Your, your brands, you're a man of, of many brands, a person of many brands, and you have the cult of vain, you have uh, KEN as well. Yeah, kinky, yeah. Erotic, kinky erotic nature um where did they come from how long have they been in your brain I, I, and can you talk me through kind of the challenges and also the best bits about developing those, those uh, brands yeah so uh oh, ken and cult of fame kind of started at the same time um so ken sounds for kinky erotic nature it's a big fetish cabaret um and uh, it, it's evolved from being a fetish cabaret. It's like got a nightclub element to it. It's got a dungeon element to it. And it's, it's really exploded into like a, a, an experience as opposed to like just a performance, which is always really fucking cool. For somebody who loves like atmospheres and creating atmospheres, that, that stuff like makes, it's what makes my heart pump. Do you know what I mean? It's, it's great. Um, but that started because I went to a, a, a shite night. I went to a night, um, in in my hometown and um it was advertised as an industrial night but the person who uh, ran the venue wanted it to be a fetish night so there was already a miscommunication between the uh the publicist and the the manager and i walked in and i was like cool we've got a new fetish night let's go this is gonna be great let's have a wonderful time let's see what it's all about and I was maybe one of 10 people there it was not good it was it was really bad it was under underpopulated everyone sort of like was in their own little circles and i was like this is god awful and i ended up having a conversation with the manager of the the bar and was, he was like look can we get you on board like to make this night better and i was like let me think about it because i've got a lot of stuff going on not sure i want to be tying myself down to something especially as the first night has been awful you know what i mean yeah and i thought about it and i turned around to him and i was like do you know what how about instead of me coming on board i just do it i use your venue yeah. But everything's mine. Everything's mine. I book the acts that I want. I take all the financial risk on myself and I do it my way. And yeah. I just pay you as a venue. And he was like, yeah, cool. Sounds good to me. And I was like, awesome. <laughs> that sounds great to me. Let's go. Um, and the first night was mad. The first night like was, was uh, I had, uh, I spent so much money on the cabaret. Um, <laughs> I lost about 700 quid, which actually, to be fair, for a first event, of of that scale is not bad at all um but yeah like people came from all over the country people came from like Birmingham because i've been doing traveling around being this bravado model pretentious prick um all over the country so many people came from like london and manchester and birmingham they were like valen we don't know what's going on 
but uh, we know you're too arrogant to put on a shit night. So <laughs> and I was like, all right, I'll take it. I'll take the backhanded compliment. Um, so yeah, that, that kind of kicked things off. And I got a passion for that of, of doing things, not just performing for other people, but doing things off my own back and, and sinking in an unreasonable amount of money into creating a night that, that was a great experience for people. And it was a great experience. It was fantastic. And that was when, after the first Ken, that was when I was like, Do you know what? I could probably, with my experience from the theater industry, with my experience of cabaret, with my experience of all these different creative industries, but also the business brain that I have, mm -hmm. um, I could probably do a good shot of doing other events as well. Yeah. So that's where I was like, cool, I need an events company name. Um, how the fuck am I going to do this? It needs yeah. to be something that's not directly associated with fetish because not everyone's going to be happy about that. And that's where Cult of Vain was spawned. I was just like, yeah, let's be a cult. Why not? <laughs> so we can be <laughs> full on throw in the gimmicks with all of the uh, of the followers. We're followers. The people come and join in. And yeah, it's great. It's really good. It's the way that it's evolved is, is fantastic. It's a, again a testament to, to your work, man, and and I think that there's something really interesting around again, you know, how it's developed from from these events that are now nationally known. Again, your you know your reputation as a model, uh, and also being able to to stream and build a, a brand around that too. Um, myself, I've been very lucky to be a part of different communities to have an understanding uh, of of the fetish community, for example, or different alternative communities, just through my experience as a journalist and creative but i find that if you don't understand it and if you don't experience it then you know it's difficult isn't it it's difficult unless you've experienced something to 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 be able to fully understand it and um it's yeah. a conversation that i that i get asked a lot because people are like why don't you get more angry that places aren't more accessible and i'm like well it, unfortunately if you don't have disability in your immediate circle or or, or family for example you're not going to not going to know about it so and this is something that we've we've been super conscious of, especially with Ken recently, because obviously mm. we locked down and canceled Ken for, for a couple of years. But when we came back, because of the fact that I'd um, opened up to streaming and have this amazing community that are, like I said, from all different walks of life, they've really educated me on how many things that I, as a cisgendered, able-bodied white man, just don't see. Mm. I just mm. don't see. And people talk about like, like white privilege and male privilege and stuff like that. And like people go, oh, I'm not privileged because I don't have the money that I can pay my bills and stuff like that. That's not what it's about. What it's about is this the fact that you have never had to see mm. the fact that there isn't a ramp here. Yeah. The fact that you have not, you've never had to see the fact that these things don't have subtitles or the fact that um, there isn't a quiet space for people with uh, sensory issues. Mm. You've mm. I've never had to think about it. I've never had to think about it until I had a conversation with a guy, um, Dan, from a company called Elephant in the Room. Yes, and yeah, yeah, great, yeah. great. I fucking love him to pieces. But I was literally, I was like, cool. So these are the things that I'm thinking of. We had a meeting. I sat down. And I was like, we're going to get some ramps in. We're going to do these things. I was thinking about getting a, um, a BSL sign language yes. interpreter for me to, to open that up. I don't think we have any. Oh, uh, at the time, I, we didn't have any like particularly like deaf um, attendance. But the point isn't to get them when you've got deaf attendance. The point is to cater for them regardless. Absolutely. Absolutely, Absolutely regardless. And it was, it was a real eye-opening conversation because he just asked me questions. He was just like, hey, cool. Like one of the questions we had, we've got like a, a group on Facebook, which is like of the, the Ken community. Mm -hmm. um, and we have, because it's a fetish night, we have an outright ban on phones. Like we've got one room where you can have your photos, but we, there's people there that want to be anonymous. Of we course. don't want people being caught in the back of uh, photographs and stuff like that. So we're like, cool, if you want to take photos, be in that room and nowhere else. And uh, other than that, outside that, ban on phones. Yeah. And then Dan just sends a message just being like, hey, I'm deaf. Just like, I use my phone as a communication aid sometimes. Mm -hmm. And I was like, oh, shit. Never thought about that. Never thought about the concept that people could use text messages just to be able to communicate, especially in a loud atmosphere where people might not be able to hear each other. And then we had we changed it. We were like, cool, let's go from no phones at all to if you have your phone out, it has to be pointing at the floor. So you okay. can use it as a communication aid for those people that might need it as a communication aid, but it has to be pointing at the floor. So we're um, like 
trying to compensate for the risks of mm. anonymity versus being there to be able to enable uh, people with disabilities. Mm. You know, mm. it goes back to what you were saying earlier about being able to take a, a no, being able to take criticism and not looking yeah. at it as. You know, that must have been difficult to hear at first. You know, actually, I haven't catered to this. Oh, you know, but actually what you what what I've understood from our conversation is that you have over the years learned that, you know, no is fine. Or that I haven't I haven't I don't know everything about this. And that's OK. Yeah, because you, you grow as a person because of that. You really do. And it's it's one of those things. I think I know the exact point as well where I can think about like when that moment happened, because I've always considered myself to be quite an open minded individual. Mm. But I am within the community. We've got a lot of transgender individuals who are amazing. I love them very, very dearly. Um, but they described me as a cis man. Mm -hmm. And I took great offense because my up until that point, my only experience of the word cis had been as a slur used by trans people to describe people that are to describe cisgender people basically they're like oh you're so cis fucking hell you just won't understand because you're so cis or what have you and i was like how like why would you call me this slur why would you call me this slur and we had a big argument i had a big argument with my chat on stream and i was like the fuck are you on about why would you throw that name at me like this is outrageous and it took a lot it took a good like half an hour for me to calm down and be like do you know what let me take a step back let me mm. let me open my mind and be like, how can these people educate me on why I am wrong? Yeah. And then it was when I found out that trans means the other side of, like transatlantic, trans pennine, the other side of, whereas cis is the Latin for the same side of. So cis man literally means I was called a male at birth and I am a male. There we go. That's literally all it means. It's a descriptive word. There's nothing more to it. And as soon as you break that stuff down, it's just like, cool, right? We're, we're all right. We're okay. Like, and that was a real realization point for me was the, was the fact that not only can I be wrong, but it's okay to be wrong. And it's okay to be publicly wrong, regardless of what people think and what the people's embarrassment and bullshit like that. It's okay to be publicly wrong because by being open and by being open-minded and be like cool correct me it, like like fix yeah. my way forward it makes me a better person it makes everyone i come in like come in contact with better people it means that i'm better educated to educate other people it just makes like if we will all have that mindset of being like cool i'm wrong correct me yeah yeah and being open to that absolutely. yeah it just yeah. makes society better <laughs> like, yeah. overall you know yeah. It's interesting, and I imagine that you, in your, because again, I, I I would call you these days an educator, uh, yeah. and because of because of your experience, not just a performer. Now, I'm wondering if you have encountered any misconceptions, and there's two strands to this question. The the biggest misconceptions about the fetish community, uh, and the kink community. What have what what have what have you found, and what would you like? Because again, you're a huge part of that. Obviously, with with kinky erotic nature, uh, obviously cabaret. You know, to people that don't understand it, might be classed as oh, you're a bit too alternative, etc. Um, what are the biggest misconceptions about? the work you do with uh, with Ken uh, uh, and also the wider fetish community? Um, so with fetish stuff in particular, I, I find two major misconceptions that happen a lot of the time. Uh, one from people that are not familiar with fetish events. Um, mm -hmm. And I'm specifically talking about events because we're in reference to Ken in general. Mm -hmm. um, one from people that are not familiar with fetish events, which is you all go there and have an orgy. Like that is that is the go to. But I'm not sure I feel comfortable, like you know, watching a show while people shag on a sofa next to me. Uh, like, it's like no, it's it's not about that. Especially with Ken, like I know there are some events that that open up to that side of things, but it's not about that. Most of it is about being there, feeling your most sexual self and and self confident and erotic self in a place that is safe for you to do so, with surrounded by people and an atmosphere where people are there to build you up mm. and, and allow you to feel that in yourself and allow you to have that self-confidence and just let loose, not feel that constant weight of, oh, I'm not as beautiful as these people or all that constant self-doubt, you know? Mm. Um, and the other one is actually from within the fetish community, um, which is 
always an interesting one. Um, and something that, that is the, one of the greatest compliments that Ken's ever had, which was uh, that people come to Ken and they don't feel a sense of, like the, the, there is a sense of elitism. Mm. Mm. Because there are a lot of, um, and, and not all by interest managing, there have been some absolutely amazing fetish nights um, in, uh, across the UK that have been absolutely fantastic. But there are certain fetish nights that I've definitely been to where there is that sense of elitism, where there's a sense of the people that go there all the time are better than everybody else. Okay. Or the people that are established in the industry are better, just better. They are allowed to look down on people and nobody's going to question it. Okay. And it's a really interesting dynamic because, I mean, I'm an arrogant fuck. So when I first go to an event, I'm like, this is me. I'm going to have a good time. Why? Because I'm a hedonist and I fucking love that shit. And they're like, uh, hmm, no, no, you're not allowed to do that. And I was like, says who? <laughs> Who's going to fucking stop me? Mm. But it's, it's really interesting to, to see that people like coming to Ken because they don't have that. Like, we don't have that. And the way that we've got round it, and it's so weird and backwards and yet brilliant, is because <laughs> I get up on stage and I'm like, hey, this night is for me. I know that you've all bought tickets, but I give a, I don't give a fuck about any of you. I've booked these acts because I want to see these acts. And if you've got a complaint, don't tell me because I don't give a shit. And weirdly, <laughs> by putting that, that layer of like, there's an elitism where I'm the top and you're all beneath me, everyone else just goes, okay, cool. Like, we're on the same level. Like, okay. arrogant fucker on the stage is uh, kingpin and the rest of us are all equal. And I was just like... Why do these people let me get away with this? I've got no idea. But uh, it always it always ends up being a laugh, and everyone always like like it's it's one of the most friendly environments and and like I said, supportive and enabling environments where people are just there to to be happy with each other. And we get people from like I say, like all like ages, all genders, all ethnicities, all body shapes, like all uh, different levels of ability and different levels of neurodiversity. And everyone just feels, or everyone to my knowledge, to like from what I can see and what I've, they've fed back to me, everyone just feels at home. And that was, that's like one of the big things is when, when I when I ask people for feedback, because I've got two amazing women that, that work with me on Ken and because I'm terrible at like the social media and, and bits and pieces, I've got too much stuff going on. Um, but they were like, cool, we will get some, some feedback, get some, like, let's, let's hear back from the community. Let's talk about how we can be more inclusive and stuff. And it's like, what, what do people think? And people were like, I felt like I was coming home. And I'm like, that is mind blowing to me. That is mind blowing that we can make this extravagant out there, completely wild event. And people feel so comfortable there that they feel like it's home. And that's yeah. oh, heart melting. It really is. It's a beautiful thing, man. Beautiful thing. I, I've got a, a bunch more questions for you, man. Um, I, I, there was there was two strands to that last one. Like I say, you mentioned uh, being a hedonist there. Yeah. Now, I, I, I've talked to you a couple of times about this uh, when we've been out and about, but obviously it's not uh, necessarily the right environment to sit down and, and really discuss it. So right. when, again, mis sorry, mis uh, not miscommunication, misconceptions around that word, what it means to you and what it means to the wider world. What, what do you wish people understood more about, about hedonism on a wider level, about you as a hedonist? Uh, and what are the, some of the biggest challenges and misconceptions that you come up against? Um, I think it's like, like hedonism is about living life for pleasure. Now, mm. across media in general, um, media is is very very good uh, especially historically very very good at painting things in the worst possible light so you turn around and you go oh a hedonist everyone goes cool dorian gray excessive drugs and orgies like like that's what people think or they think of like motley crew or something in the heyday of the 80s they're just like cool people going all out getting absolutely like like hazards of human beings and yes i might be a hazard of a human being but there's an indifferent note you know what i mean <laughs> Um, but but it, like the core of it is living life for pleasure, and what what makes life pleasurable, mm. and that's that it's different for every person. Like I've got loads of people in the community who just love a nice quiet ho night at home with their cats crocheting, and that gives them pleasure. And I'm like, cool, do more of it. Yeah, do shit that makes you happy. Do the, 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 put the smile on your face. Yeah, and and that is like the core of hedonism because that that is the pinnacle of it. Live life. Mm. Or pleasure what makes you happy 
do more of that. Mm. So long mm. as it's all like consensual and between like consenting adults and it's not going to hurt anybody overall, unless, you know, they're asking for it, like in a literal consensual way. Hey, who am I to judge? Yeah. Um, like that's what it's all about. But the misconceptions are, are very similar to what I just said. Like a lot of people being like, oh, of course cool, so you have orgies all the time. And I'm like, no, but at the same time, if I did, would, is that a problem? Like, like if it makes me happy and everyone's consenting and everyone's involved because they want to be involved, is that a problem? Mm. Is, that, is that an issue? Like, yeah, a yeah. lot of people don't like the idea that it's okay to be happy. Yeah. Yeah, and that's, yeah that's, a, that's a, always a really interesting one because especially in my community where we've got people from all walks of life and, and some people have had some really, really bad, um, like, lives up until this point mm. where they have it in their brain that they do not deserve happiness for whatever reason. Now, I'm not going to go into examples yeah, or anything like that, but yeah. I've definitely met lots of people and I'm like, okay, well, why do you say that? Mm. And it always comes down to, well, uh, I don't know. Mm. Because everyone deserves happiness. Everyone deserves happiness. Like it's, it's, so bizarre to think about it but you do you're like you deserve to be happy and everyone around you deserves to be happy also and sometimes it takes in order to be happy eventually it takes a little bit of pain to be like thinking like breaking up and what have you and and people going their separate ways or cutting out toxic friends or toxic family members from your life mm. it's, that stuff hurts mm. but in the long run you'll be happier yeah yeah you know it's, yeah it's 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 interesting and and, and obviously you know in terms of getting to that happy, like I, I'm going to ask you a straight question: Are you happy? Um, mostly. Okay. And I think, and I think the the what it basically comes down to is, I don't think. I think everybody has moments of happiness. Yeah. I think when it comes down to life, life is about moments, and you will have moments of happiness, but you'll also have moments of sadness. And the great that one of the great things about a moment of sadness is that if like, you can't truly appreciate those moments of happiness unless you've had the moments of sadness because you have nothing to compare it to. It's true. Yeah. You know what I mean? There's a there's a brilliant book. Oh, here we go. There's a brilliant book. It's a 1913 book called Don'ts for Wives by okay. uh, by Blanche Ebert. Um, we have this thing on my thing, which is people ask me to do some Victorian advice. So we have this. And there's a brilliant quote in it by, by Blanche, because I really wanted to hate this book. A book that <laughs> says don'ts for wives, yeah. I genuinely wanted to hate because I was like, oh, the misogyny. But it's actually really good. Um, where the fuck is it? <laughs> there you go. And this was written in 1913. It's unreasonably good. Don't look at the black side of the cloud. It is only a shadow cast by the silver lining. Oh, there you go. Yeah, beautiful. Why is that so good? It upsets beautiful. me so much, but it is. It's perfect. It's just like, yeah, you're going through some shit now, but you will mm. when when you have a good point, you'll be able to compare it to this shit moment, and you'll appreciate that good point all the more because yeah. of of your experience at this moment. You know, absolutely, man. Absolutely. I, I, again, I, I'm learning a lot just talking to you, and, and in terms of how how I reflect on things as well. So it, it's definitely useful. Uh, for me on, on numerous levels um five more questions now and i'm gonna no, no. i'm gonna um start with an opinion and i'm very very aware that it's an opinion and okay. um, and also that uh you know obviously i have a degree of privilege as well um the more that i do work around difference and diversity i'm finding that different communities i'm working with so neurodiverse poly gender diverse for example mm -hmm. uh, that's becoming more prevalent in music and the arts in terms of being more accepted now this is me you know doing interviews and working in journalism uh working with a certain narrative now you are directly working with these communities on a regular basis um, I would like to think that things are becoming more accepting and more diverse and more, you know, there's, there's more open-minded people out there in East Yorkshire and beyond. Um, am I wrong or am I right? Do you find that, that, that these different communities are becoming more accepted, more supported, or, or is there more work to be done? I, I think there's always more work to be done. I think there's always more work to be done. And, and one thing that I want to say openly is that uh, you only ever hear about the bad stuff. Like mm. bad news sells, you know what I mean? So you're mm. going to hear about the turfs that hate trans people. You're going to hear about the the um, 
people that beat up this gay kid. Do you know what I mean? You're always going to hear the, the negative side of things. Mm -hmm. um, but I think society as a whole is slowly moving, but it is moving forward. And mm. a lot of it comes down to um, exposure more than anything else. Mm. There's more people being open about being trans. There's more people being open about their sexualities and, and what that means to them and the, the fluidity of sexuality and the fluidity of, of we as people, as we grow, as we learn more, as we, every single day we change and it's about whether we change for the better or the worse. And if we change for the better, then society as a whole is always going to change for the better. Um, and, and it's really interesting, but I had a conversation with an amazing uh, content creator called Babbling Goat, who's also an LGBTQI lecturer. Yeah. Oh, the, the conversation we had um, regarding society and preconceptions and how it's so hard for some of, or how it always feels so hard for some of the older generation to mm. get their heads around the idea that there are more than two genders, that somebody can be trans and go from one gender to another and, and stuff like that. And the way that um, Ablingo described it, the way he described it was, was genius. And he was like, think about your life and the way that you construct it as like a Jenga tower. Mm. And it's like you build it up and you build it up and build it up. And sometimes you are faced with a decision where you need to take a block out because that block is wrong or your perception of that block is wrong. But you take a block out. And if it's blocked near the top, that's fine because the top falls down. You just build up a little, a little bit more. But if it's a block near the bottom and you're talking about breaking down the entire tower to restart again with this brand new conception, and if you've been working on that tower for 50, 60 years, yeah. taking out that bottom block is a terrifying concept. Yeah. Taking out that bottom block is, is worrying to you and you will, you will dig your heels in and you will shout and you will rave and you will argue because you re it's not that you don't want to change your perceptions. It's just that you really don't want to take out that block. Mm. You really don't mm. want to have to rethink everything that you've learned over the past 60 years. Yeah, And I thought that was a beautiful way of putting it because it, it really does. It's like, okay, cool. Yeah, like it, it, you're stuck in your ways because you're sticking your heels in because what I am trying, what this small concept of the idea that there's more than two genders and gender is a social construct is mm. so alien to you that it means that you are going to be taken out. You're not going to take out a top block like us, but mm. you're going to take out a bottom block. And that is going to break down a lot of what you have considered to be your life over the past yes. 40 years yeah it's mad it's mad and i love it i shouldn't say mad either because that is an ableist term and the classic example classic example of it's, things it's education we just, things. Yeah. It's, it's education man i mean that's the thing and it goes back to that that uh disability conversation earlier that's you know what a part of my conversation it's about people learning and willing to be willing to learn but if they argue at first it's just because the, it's a lack of understanding it's mm -hmm. not because necessarily they're they're a, they're a dick, you know. Yeah. All these people, it's just that there's a lack of understanding there, and obviously that willingness to learn and grow is different in different people. But it's you know. But it's also it's 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 a two way thing with stuff mm. like that. We had a situation a while ago on one of my streams where, um, like I said, I've got a large uh, yeah. percentage of trans individuals that are part of the stream, which is great. I love them all to pieces. They're fantastic. Um, but somebody came in that was relatively new. They'd been there for a few streams and they referred to uh, trans people as traps. Oh, okay. And as in somebody pretending to be somebody else so that they can trap somebody, etc. And the first thing that happened, because I get behind on the chat, the first thing that happened was a lot of our trans course, community yeah. jumped down their throat. And they were like, how dare you? You call us this, you absolute bastard. Why would you do this? Blah, blah, blah. And, and I got to it and I was like, whoa, stop everything. Put everything on emo only so no one can comment or anything like that. Let's take a step back. Let me explain to this person why that is a bad term. Yeah. And I did. We took a moment. I explained it. I was like, hey, this is the reason why. This is the reason why tra trap is a bad term, because of the idea that somebody's trying to be something they're not in order to lure somebody into a false sense of security, like a predatory type thing. I explained the entire scenario, brought up the, the chat again, and the, the first comment was that person being like, I am so sorry. I thought mm. it was just like, street slang term for um, trans people. I had mm. no idea about the slur connotation. Thank you so much for educating me. And I was like, yeah, like all, sometimes it's hard because a lot of people will see it as an attack. But sometimes you've got to take that step back and be like, cool, this is the reason why that's a bad term. Let me educate you. Then if they turn around and are like, 
hey, no, fuck you. Mah. Then you can be like, cool, you're, you're a dickhead. Fuck you, I, I'm out. But if you take that moment, if you take that little moment to take a step back and be like, hey, let me explain to you why what you've just said is not okay. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Then you are giving them the chance to change. Absolutely. And you're giving them a chance to be educated and be a better person. Yeah, and that understanding and support of nature, it, it seems to be a big part of your community. And you've oh, hugely. That. Yeah. It, I mean, I, I frequently say that the community is, I, I'm not a part of the community, I'm just the face of the community. That, that community is well and truly beyond even me and my ego. Mm. Like, it's, it's mind-blowing. Like, they're, they're so supportive and they're so, they're always so there for each other. And like, somebody's having a bad time but doesn't want to talk about it, people are like, hey, drop me a DM and I'll, mm. I'll, if you want to talk about it. And there's like little things that have, have evolved from that. Like, we've got like a rant space in, in like a Discord and it's like, start it off with being like, either, hey, looking for advice or just want to rant. Because one of the big things mm. that I learned recently was, Sometimes people don't want advice. I'm a fix it person. Somebody's like, hey, how's it going? I've got a minimum, minimum, minimum. And my first thing is cool. Let me sort this stuff out yeah. so we can fix that together. And sometimes people don't want it fixed. Sometimes people just want it off their chest. Yeah. And that's okay. And that's all right. And that was a big learning curve for me as well. So yeah, yeah it's been wild. Yeah, that's really cool. Again, we'll, we'll talk um, three more questions now. One of them is how you've progressed and developed. But before that, this is a question I use in, in a lot of interviews with musicians and artists, sports entertainers, whatever, because it means different things to different people. Now, I look at you and I think success. You've able to been able to create events. You've been able to perform around the country. You've, you've done a lot of traveling. Um, but there are other people, people that would look at you and go, you know, I, I'm never, I'm never going to be like that. I'm never going to be like Valen. I'm never going to have what Valen has got. You know, I, I can't, I can't do that. I can't, you know, I can't present a, a show. I can't get on stage. And, and I wonder, you know, I, I can't be successful in that way. And I wonder what, what is your definition of success, Valen? And has that, how has that changed and developed over your life? Um, good question. Oh, these are good questions. It's almost like you do this as a job. Um, <laughs> Oh, I think I think everybody's definition of success is very, very different. And it's mm. a very personal thing um, to define what you consider to be successful. Um, I will, I'm very, very aware that one of my biggest flaws is the fact that I will never consider myself successful. Okay. And, and one of the reasons why is it's, it's a double barrel thing. One of them is because I always want to do something more. So no matter how big I get, there's always going to be something more. But also... As part of that, it means that I'm always pushing for something like something more. Mm. So, like I do some amazing things in my life, and and with especially with the team with Ken, with Sway and Lilia, like we collectively have created this this amazing event, which is super wholesome and super amazing and fantastic. We've got I've got a stream that has got a community that is mind blowingly supportive, mind blowingly amazing. Like, it's just just so absolutely amazing, and yet I don't consider myself a success. Because there's always something more. There's always something to strive towards. There's always something that's going to push me to to keep going and pushing forward and and all that. Um, and I love it. I, to be honest with you, I, I'm perfectly fine with not being a success because I just want to keep going. I keep like pushing things. I, I hate being inside my comfort zone. I'm like, right, where's the next thing? Where's the next thing? Um, but as for like people being like, oh, I could never do that. Unless you try, you don't know. Mm. I've got a motto that I've taken the piss out of for years, but I love it so much. Try everything twice because the first time it might hurt. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. But it works. It's like, like, like I said, the, the amount of times, like think about Ken. We've talked about Ken's mm. day. The amount of like somebody who did an event like Ken put all that money into it and then came out and went, shit, I've lost 700 quid. Mm. I had one of two options. I go, shit, I've lost 700 quid. That's a lot of fucking money. I lost 700 quid. What? I've got a choice now. Either I pack it in and go, fucking hell, I failed at that. Or I turn around and go, cool, I need to make that money back. Yeah. How do I do that? Let's see what I can do with the next event where I can take, take things back a bit so I, make le so I make less of a loss and push forward about other things. And now here we are, what, five years, well, not including the two pandemic years, five years later, and we're doing sellout shows, and, and it's great. Do you know what I mean? Amazing. Um, and, but it is, it, and, and I think a lot of it comes down to perspective. Yes. And it, it does come down to how you view your life and, and what you are willing to do, again, to be happy. 
to put yeah. a smile on your face. Like, what are you willing to do? I'm willing to lose a fuck ton of money to do an event that I wasn't entirely sure was going to succeed and definitely wasn't sure that it was going to succeed after the pandemic. Yeah. Never mind, but like anything else, do you know what I mean? I had so many things and I booked loads of performers and, and stuff like that. And at the end of the day, life is a risk. Yeah. Life is a risk and, and life is about change and people are afraid of change. But at the end of the day, we all change every day. We don't have a choice over it. Yeah. So we've got a choice. Either we re reject the change and freak out about the fact that stuff's going wrong or we try and go with the flow and see what happens. And it's not always going to be comfortable, but it's always going to push us forward. Yeah. And that's, a, a, yeah, perspective. I've, I've, absolutely, man. And before we do the, the, the plugging bit at the end, you know, you mentioned change there and a little bit before where you actually the interview is littered with ways that you've changed and developed, things that you've learned. If you could reflect on, on some of the key ways that you have changed and developed from the very beginning of your career, from, you know, taking you back to, to, to you know, coming out of university or even, yeah. you know, wherever you choose, even that person in the bathroom. What have, you, what have you learned about yourself? How have you changed and developed as a person uh, through, your, through your career and through the work that you've done? Um, oh, damn it. I would say that the biggest thing that I have noticed... Um, Oh, God damn, more good questions. I think exactly. like, like understanding of perspective is mm -hmm. definitely one of the big things that I've learned. Understanding that it's okay to be wrong. Understanding that shit might be hit the fan, but there's all, like I, I've said before um, in, in my streams and, and on stage even, anything that I do is only ever 60% ready. Because mm -hmm. I am very aware that that 40% shit's going to hit the fan, and I would rather have that 40% of leeway. So I, I organize everything so it's like 60% ready to go and then yeah. doors open or I get on stage and I'm like, whatever happens, happens. Yeah, yeah. And the thing is that the, the mind-blowing thing is that so many people are like, oh, I couldn't do that. And yet, how many times has shit hit the fan in your life and you've just dealt with it? Yeah, yeah. You've just dealt with it. It's like, oh shit, there's a fire alarm that I wasn't expecting. Cool. So we're all just going to get up and walk out because that's... Yeah. Do you know what I mean? Like it, you, you do, you just deal with it because we all do. And it's a weird concept that people are like, I couldn't do that in my brain. And yet if it's put in front of my face, I don't have a choice. I have to deal with it. So I deal with it. Mm -hmm. um, there's that. There's definitely that. Um, mm -hmm. I had another one as well. What were we talking? So there's, there's perspective side of things. Oh, the other thing is that the vast majority of people don't care. That That is such like... Oh, it's so good. The amount of times that, uh, like, it. But what does it matter? Was was a thing that my dad used to say to me when I was a young preteen and being like, "I've got to have these tracksuit bottoms, otherwise everyone will hate me." And my dad's like, "But what does it matter?" Yeah. Well, it, it matters because of these things. And my dad would be like, "But what does it matter?" And we go for twenty minutes, and everything, yeah. everything I said, every reason I had for a reason it matters. My dad would be like, "Yeah, but what does that actually matter?" <laughs> and yeah, it's it's brilliant because it people don't care. People worry about. Oh, what happens if I walk out in the street and I'm wearing something and people look at me? So people look at you. Like the, the vast majority of people are going to look at you and go, oh, that's a really cool outfit. Or they're going to look past you and not even realize that you're there because people, generally speaking, don't give a fuck. Yeah. They just don't care. So you might as well do the things that make you happy in your life. Like yeah. I, I, I had a TikTok about this a little while ago where for a really long period of time, I would dress as myself mm. or the way i'd see it is is in my ooh, excuse me in my hometown mm. i would dress like myself and then when i went out of uh like York, the yorkshire area i would dress as this big flamboyant valen vein character and then as time went on i realized that i wasn't dressing up out of town i was dressing down in town yeah yeah and the person, yeah, the person that was really me was the big flamboyant character that I go around other cities in. And the person that I was in my hometown was like a diluted version of me. Mm. And nowadays I'm, I'm wandering around in my metallic jeans and high top boots and tiny little purple waistcoats and stuff. And I'm like, yeah, I don't give a fuck. Like if people don't like it, that's their issue, not mine. Do you know what I mean? Fuck it. <laughs> Absolutely, man. Well, as, as you know, uh, a lot of people find it quite fabulous. 
uh, as they as they should. Um, uh, and I'm, I'm I for one, I'm very glad uh, that you are doing what you're doing in the area you're doing it in. I think it, it brings more, you know, it brings more people to the area. It brings more diversity, inclusion, and, and I think it's I think it's fantastic. It's a testament to the hard work you've put in. So Thank you. congratulations on that. Um, this is the the plugging bit. So you have your stream, you have uh, thirsty work, you have all these things, but I'm putting words in your mouth here. So uh, <laughs> tell me about uh, what you would like to plug. Where would you like to send people? Oh, where would I like to send people? Uh, people, you can find me at Val and Vane on pretty much all social medias. So if you go into Twitch, uh, TikTok, Instagram, pretty much anywhere, um, at Val and Vane is, is where you'll find me, depending on what kind of uh, bits and pieces you're into. I also run a podcast called uh, Thirsty Work, as we talked about. It's a sex education podcast talking about a lot of things that a lot of people all want to know about, but don't dare ask the questions about, um, mm. where we talk, we've talked about uh, sex and physical disability, sex and uh, um, uh, gender diversity, and uh, all kinds of bits and pieces, which has been great to do. It's been a real eye-opener for me as well. I'm, I consider myself a sex educator, and I'm still being like, wow, this is amazing. Tell, tell me more about these things. Um, and yeah, and then we run uh, Ken, Big Kinky Erotic Nature Night. Um, we're looking at doing more and more of those, potentially even rolling out across the country in the coming years, um, and some more events coming. But yeah, if you find me on uh, Twitch, TikTok, uh, Twitter, Instagram, at Val and Vane, I'm sure you'll know all about it because I am, I like to chat shit, you know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah, man, it's, it's, a, it's a great brand. Like I say, it's good to see you in so many, so many places. Um, before we finish off, um, you know, obviously there is a big community behind you. There is a big community uh, who are yet to discover you. What is your message to those people that have supported you um, and will continue to support you as you go on with your career? Um, my message is I have always been self-reliant. I have always pushed myself because the things that I do are outside of what most people consider normal. And mm. therefore it's been hard to get people to um, support me in a way that they understand what I'm doing. Mm -hmm. And yet, the support that I have been getting over the past few years, especially online, has been mind melting to me. Yeah. Like I am not used to having support. I am used to doing things by myself. And here I am in a position where I don't know what I'd do without that support. Because even though I am a very capable individual and I can push myself and push myself and do an amazing job at the vast majority of life by just being optimistic and and just going, fuck it, it went wrong, but let's keep going. The support is, well, my withered husks of uh, tear ducts have shed many a tear um, of the kindness of people and the, 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 level of, the level of joy that I have inadvertently brought people. Because I've always said the, the, the best way to make other people happy is to learn to be happy yourself. Because you will naturally make people happier around you if you're a happy person. Absolutely, man. Weirdly works. It, it just does. It's strange, but beautiful, you know? It is absolutely strange and beautiful, just like yourself. Absolutely, oh, man. 100%. <laughs> there you go, there you go. Well, well honestly, Valen, it's been an absolute pleasure to sit down with you and have this chat. Obviously, I expect there'll be more in the future as well. As I hope I'm so. very, very excited about your future and, and all of the work you're doing. And thank you so much for taking so much time out of your day for me today. I appreciate no, it. No, no, my pleasure. My absolute pleasure.